So good afternoon. My name is Alina Polyakova. I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. And it, I once again want to acknowledge uh, the success of this event, as we can see from this full room today, uh, that we've done in partnership with the Charles Koch Institute, uh, Johns Hopkins SAIS, and of course, uh, FPRI, and also UPenn. It's really my pleasure and a true honor to welcome General Philip Breedlove to deliver the keynote for this event. Uh, General Breedlove is the former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO Europe, the highest post in NATO. He spent a large portion of his military career in Europe as well. Uh, he told me earlier today that eight of his overseas posts were in Europe, three were in Asia. He began as a young captain and then returned as a four-star general to lead the first U.S. Air Force in Europe and then all of NATO's forces. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014, General Breedlove was one of the prime architects of the American response, which involved reinforcing Eastern Europe quickly with a small number of U.S. troops and working overtime to help build consensus for a larger and more robust plan to double down on the alliance's eastern flank. Uh, he is actually most proud not of this work, he told me, but of the work he's done with young officers when he was major commander, a post he held eight times over his illustrious career. And of course, General Breedlove has been a strong voice in calling the U.S. to refocus its technical intelligence and collective defense capabilities on Russia after many years of focus on the Middle East and the fight on terror. So without further ado, uh, I would like to please welcome uh, General Breedlove to the stage. General. Okay, well, one of the first things they teach you in the military is not to stand up and disqualify yourself when you're about to, speech, so, to speak, so I won't disqualify myself. I will qualify the what I'm about to do and that is if you're looking for a speech you're not going to get it. I rarely do speeches. I want to have a talk. I want to roll out some ideas on the table and respond to your questions about some of those ideas. And the qualification of what I'm about to say is that you must remember from whence I come and that is that I was the NATO military commander and so the thoughts that I will talk about now will be primarily aimed towards defense policy. And these are questions, and I would call them concerns or worries that I have about the policy decisions that our, our new uh, government will face as it comes into being and our existing government will face during the transition. None of these, I think, will surprise you. Uh, but what I want to do is sort of add my flavor of the concerns on these areas. The first one was uh, mentioned, I thought, very well this morning. And that is our vector with our large neighbor to the east in NATO is not good. We're not headed in a positive direction. And I would opine that we have to determine how to arrest that bad direction and how to create a more positive path forward with this, this neighbor. Um, I agree with what has been said numerous times just in the last week or so that no matter who is elected or what happens across the next weeks or week or two that none of this change that I believe we need to see is going to happen fast. We are in for a, as my father would say, a spell of bad weather. And we have to get through that storm to a better place. The question which was asked very nicely in my prep for this is, what is Russia's incentive? And I think as we talk about this, in Russia's eyes, they probably see things moving very nicely now. They see themselves back on center stage. They see themselves as being seen as a superpower. So how do we build those incentives that would bring them to a place where we might chart a more cooperative future? Again, the vector is not good. From Georgia, Crimea, to the Donbass, I see steady pressure still in the wrong direction. 
In Georgia, we hear almost weekly about a line moving. One of the very last trips I made as the Supreme Allied Commander was to South Ossetia. And I visited a little town where an elderly couple that used to live on the edge of town that was very reliant on that town for medical care woke up one morning with a Russian barbed wire fence separating them from their town and met, forcing them to go many kilometers to the north to get to uh, the, the medical care that they needed. And this sort of line jostling in Georgia seems to just slip under the radar here in the United States. There seems to be no concern about these sort of actions. In Crimea, we still see the weaponization, the preparation of the capabilities to, in a minimum, exert influence in the Black Sea at the maximum to sort of control at least the northern half of the Black Sea. And in the Donbass, I believe you all saw the OSE remarks and OSE uh, reports this week, which points out that weapons, money, and people continue to flow from Russia into the Donbass. So the vector in some of these key areas is not good. Uh, and let's not forget about the Arctic and Syria. I do want to say, though, that most, there are one or two in here that have actually been on my staff. We, you might have to ask them afterwards. But most people see me as an optimist, a half glass half full person. So while these are all challenges, and frankly, the vector may be bad on these, these challenges, they are all, everyone, also an opportunity to find that first step of cooperation that we might need to chart a better future. So now, what I want to do with that is sort of the first few minutes, is talk about sort of three challenges that worry me. These may not be the top three on any of your lists. But these are three things that, as I left as SACUR, I wish I had been able to do more to correct. These are places where I, I find myself maybe a C plus or a B minus, and I wish that I could have gotten the paper to an A. The first is what some out there call hybrid uh, war. Some call uh, in Russia active measures. What I have begun to call uh, conflict or competition below the lines or below the threshold. And that is this, this broad-based competition across all the elements of national power, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. None of this, by the way, is new. This has been going on around the world uh, for, for some time. Frankly, on both sides of the equation. We do some of the same things out there. I think what is more surprising or at least concerning about this, this conflict or competition below the lines now is those things that have become maybe more overt, more open to the public. Certainly, uh, as was discussed in this morning's first panel, the cyber component of this competition below the lines has become much more public. I was one of the first people hacked and played out on WikiLeaks. Um, and so I have felt this personally, this war below the lines or below the threshold of more overt action. And you have heard me say in the past, and I continue to say because for a fighter pilot, repetition is important. And that is this, that the most surprising thing to me in this new style of exterior competition is that force is back on the table to change internationally recognized borders in Europe, a la Crimea, a la Donbass, a la South Ossetia, et cetera, et cetera. And so how do we deal with that? Um, and, and, and probably surprising to some of the nations that I still visit in my post-military post career is how do we come to grips with that? This is happening in every nation in our alliance. It's tailored in each nation because what remains below the threshold of response is very different in nation A than it might be in nation B. But if you believe what was agreed to this morning about meddling or trying to influence the U.S. election and how sort of overt that plays out, 
then it becomes easier for other nations to understand, yes, this is happening in our nation too. And how do we deal with it? If it's happening here, I ask the question, then who is immune? And I think the answer is no one is immune. So, big policy questions. What does our tolerance say? What does our action or inaction say as it relates to everything from cyber in an election to continually meddling in the borders in South Ossetia? Where are we setting the bar as it relates to this conflict below the lines or below the thresholds? And what, again, does inaction mean? So the response, I think, is also key. Um, if you ever hear a senior military officer complain about big international issues, one of the first things that you will hear is that that often the military element seems to be the first tool of resort. And I would opine that in most of these instances we've talked about, the military element should not be the first tool to be used. Rather that our nation should consider all of its elements of power and try to do them in a way that may bring more balanced focus on the problem. For instance, uh, if you would allow me to use that, that old war college model, DIME, Diplomatic, Informational, Military, and Economic, our response to much of uh, Russia's um, issues with us has been a big E, some D, almost zero I. We have not really entered the information battle and, and very little M. So would a more balanced approach using our diplomatic, informational, and to some degree our military tools, coupled with that large E economic component, would it be a better approach? That I believe is something the next administration will have to take on. The second conundrum that bothers me, and I'll quickly get through these last two so we can get to your questions. The second conundrum is how do you deal in either the information or dialogue space or in the actual military space, how do you deal with an opponent whose central theme of how to approach the West is an escalate to de-escalate regime? Meaning no matter what you do, we will do it a little harder, a little deeper, a little faster, and a little bit more dramatically in order to convince you not to test us in these waters. In a grand sense, it's a philosophy, a philosophy designed to uh, help us make the decision that we should not compete and that to some degree capitulate to what we see. How do you deal with that? Again, I challenged in the first uh, couple of points about what does no response mean? What does that say if we have no response? So how to deal, both in the information uh, and the diplomatic sense, as well as military, with an escalate to de-escalate de um, opponent. And it was, uh, again, touched well in the first um, group this morning. How do you provoke or not provoke? How do you not miss time um, so that you create more problems than you had? And in this regime, how do you not capitulate and by capitulating reward bad behavior? Tough, tough way forward. Then the last of the three things that worries me, frankly, is uh, all of the discussions and all of the new conversations about nukes and where they might be used and where they might not be used. I haven't gotten through all of the, the recent uh, uh, discussions at Sochi I understand that possibly there was some language there that might have been a little more open door into in more uh, to a more well-grounded conversation about nuclear weapons. I hope that to be the case, and I'm going to search that out and try to get to that reading here in the next couple of days. It's it's unfortunate that we would have an overture, possibly a possible 
positive overture at Sochi and then turn right around and have one of our northern NATO allies threaten this week that the introduction of U.S. Marines in, in a rotational basis on their soil would make them a nuclear target. So I think there's some, some mismatch of dialogue possibly uh, coming out of there. But the bottom line is for a military commander to be in a regime where one has to plan and one is planning and thinking about how to approach an issue with an opponent that says tactical nukes are, are an uh, important part of any conventional uh, conflict or could be. That's a tough problem to hoe. And I think that's, again, the third thing that, uh, that I think that this new administration will have to face. So let's get back to the Phil Breedlove that is a glass half full. There are lots of issues. Lots of issues. Any of these issues could be that first step towards trying to find a more productive future. I'm sure it'll come out in the Q&A. But I, I do believe that we have to find a path to productive dialogue. Productive dialogue is not being in the vicinity of each other, talking at each other, and delivering national positions. Productive dialogue is dialogue that would lead to a measurable, verifiable, tangible outcome that nations could see and say the U.S. and Russia have made an agreement and made an improvement in situation X. That's the kind of dialogue we need that produces good behavior that could rebuild a trust relationship so that we could move forward on that trust relationship. So with that, I think I'll, I'll sit down and I'm prepared for questions. General, thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, you mentioned a few interesting themes, so I just want to start off the discussion by asking you a couple of questions before we go over to the audience. Um, so one thing that you were talking about is the need for dialogue. But on the other hand, also the need to expand our military, informational, and diplomatic commitments to balance it out with the economic side that we've already been seeing uh, as a result of sanctions. But the question is, you know, multiple administrations, Republican and Democrat, as we heard earlier today, have tried to re-engage with Russia, have extended uh, the hand of dialogue. Uh, we've tried uh, a stronger hand as well. So how do you balance dialogue and deterrence? Uh, how do you strike that difficult balance? So uh, not in avoiding your question, but in sort of turning it a little bit to balance deterrence and dialogue you have to first have deterrence and dialogue. And I'm not sure that where we sit today, we would be completely happy with where we are in either regard. As I said before, I think there's a lot of dialogue. But is it productive? Does it lead to measurable, quantifiable uh, steps that folks could see so that the dialogue meant something? Are there regimes about the way we do exercises, the way we report things? Uh, are there ways that we move or fashion our troops uh, in the Western military district or in the Asian nations? Are there those things that we could look at that would, where dialogue turns into results? Now that's good. The deterrence piece, I think, is an interesting question, too. How do you prove a negative? Um, I believe there, we are deterring in, in a certain sense. Um, and I think that NATO's unity and strength and complete uh, commitment to Article 5 is a great deterrence. But how is that deterrence working for us in this, what I talked about, this competition below the threshold or below the lines? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that it's working all that well for us in many of those cases. So I think we have work to do on our, our, uh, our dialogue and work to do on our, um, our deterrence. Balancing them uh, is absolutely key because I don't think that productive dialogue uh, comes from a place where we do not have an effective mm -hmm. deterrence. So earlier on the uh, second panel on sanctions, David Kramer was making the point that the problem that we have with Russia now is not the lack of dialogue or the lack of communication, right? 
you know, Carrie and Lavrov, uh, as David put it, might as well move in together. Mm -hmm. uh, they meet so often. Uh, but it sounds like you're describing a different kind of dialogue. So could you elaborate a bit more on what you mean there and, and speak yeah. a little bit to David's earlier point as well? So I, I agree. We have a lot of dialogue going on. I think that's kind of what I said a moment ago. This, But what what is happening, I think, is is uh, not because there isn't an attempt. This is not criticizing anyone's efforts. Mm -hmm. But I think what we need to do is find those places where we could, we could find some form of, and it's dangerous to throw a word out because that's the word that gets reported, cooperation, collaboration, find a spot where we can get to uh, uh, something useful and productive, again, that can be measured, verified, and for people on both sides of the argument to see such that this is not just more chatter and actually something of meaning. I think that's the way to talk. And I remember I was reading a bit about uh, some of the things you said in the past um, about, about Russia specifically. And right before uh, you left your position in May of, of this year, you made a really famous, at this point, comment, which is you said, and I quote, uh, Russia may now be 10 feet tall, but they're pretty close to seven feet tall. Um, and you said this back in May. So could you tell us what you meant by that and how do you assess the threat that Russia poses today uh, to Europe? So, so the context was a little important and it's not always transmitted when those few lines were transmitted. But, but the point being that uh, in the Western and Central and Southern military districts, uh, Russia is able to amass force and capability very quickly. Um, and uh, if you follow the great writer Jomini, he talks about interior lines, which just mentions the very quick ability to move mass and supply based on great infrastructure in the Western military district. So in the Western, Central, and Southern military districts, um, Russia was able demonstrated very ably in the context of Donbass and Crimea that they can rapidly assemble force, sometimes under the guise of a snap exercise, others, other times just as a movement, and they could rapidly put force together. But what I was trying to do there was be intellectually honest, because if a military man or woman gets up and the first thing they're talking about is Russia is 10 feet tall, 10 feet tall, Quite often, your voice will be dismissed mm -hmm. as a plea for more money, more men, more ships, more airplane, or whatever. So what I was trying to do was to be intellectually honest, to say that the Russian force is a learning and adaptive force. Mm -hmm. It uh, did not do so well in the first incursion into Georgia. It got much better when it went into Crimea. It learned in Crimea and was even better when it into Dom, went into Donbass, and then was even better at several of the things they needed to be better at when they went into Syria. So this is a learning and adaptive force that has capabilities. It's not the 10 foot tall Soviet Union we used to talk about, but clearly it is a capable force. And you know, a, a question to kind of take you uh, in a forward-looking direction. You mentioned a few times that you are an optimist, and this is how your staff uh, would probably describe you. But you know, looking ahead, we are at perhaps the lowest point of US-Russia relations uh, mm -hmm. since the Cold War. Uh, what kind of future do you envision with Russia? Uh, in other words, you know, what is the end goal right, mm -hmm. that the US should seek to affect in its relationship with Russia? Uh, thanks for this. You and I talked a little bit about this before, and I'm, I'm glad we get to talk about it here. Um, our nation uh, has sort of coined the phrase that we, we want to see a Europe whole, free, and at peace. I certainly ascribe to that, uh, and I'm not a great writer of uh, grand strategy. But I, I often add to that a, a, a Europe whole, free, at peace, and prosperous. Now, why do I add prosperous? I think prosperous is important because if our economies improve and our nation's economies and, and people are more prosperous, it solves a lot of the ills that bring internal pressures on nations anyway. Certainly, it would help with the current refugee flow if our, uh, the nations of Europe were more prosperous and their economies were on the rise uh, uh, in a demonstrative way. And so uh, why is... Uh, this important. 
or why would we talk about it in the context of Russia? It's my opinion, I'm not an economist, I'm an engineer. But it's my opinion that being prosperous in Europe would be far easier if Russia was a part of that equation. Again, let's go back to that word. What is the word that we need to coin as our future with Russia? Is it a partnership? Is it a collaboration? Is it an understanding? Is it a, you name it. There's any host of words to describe it. But if we can get to that point where we're not competing in a belligerent sense, we can be more apt to be prosperous. Uh, prosperity first, I believe, begins with security. And if we can get to that security arrangement that allows for prosperity to, to happen, then uh, we're going to be in a better place. And, and back to the same interior lines that we talked about before. The, the road rail infrastructure, the energy infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that Russia could bring to the table if we found ourselves in a better position with them would help us with that. So what, what do I want to see? Mm -hmm. What I would like to see is that we are able to find some future relationship first, first, based on good behavior that allows us to get to whole free at peace and prosperous. I think that is an optimistic vision. <laughs> so you li live up to your reputation. But you know, if I could push you a little bit on this, and I have to admit one of your uh, former staff members said that I should ask you this. Um, <laughs> you know, put yourself in Moscow, yeah. right? How does this all look from Moscow's perspective? So. You know, if we're talking about the end goal that we want to achieve, that we want right. to see Europe whole, free, at peace, and prosperous, where Russia is a contributing actor to that vision, uh, you know, what is the end goal with the U.S. and Europe that Russia seems to mm -hmm. be seeking to achieve? What is Russia's end goal in all this? Right. Um, again, I think I would uh, agree with some learning colleagues who have written recently, um, and one as recently as yesterday, that that uh, what Russia wants first and foremost is to be seen as an equal and be treated as a world superpower mm -hmm. in a multipolar context. And frankly, what is the view from Moscow right now? They're probably pretty happy. Mm -hmm. They see themselves at the center of most of the great power conflict that's going on. They see themselves even the center of the discussion about the US elections. And so I would say that right now Russia see, feels better about themselves on the world stage than they did years before. Um, I think that uh, um, this is one of their goals, but certainly um, Russia wants to be a great nation and, and recover its economy and, and other things. So they, I think, also have internal uh, concerns. Uh, I think, though, that um, in, uh, when Russia looks at us, they see Kosovo, they see Iraq, they see the dissolution of the ABM Treaty, they see NATO enlargement, they see Libya, and to a certain degree they take umbrage with us over Syria. And so there are a lot of a path through history that is ingrained in their thought that puts the U.S. in a bad light, and, and they want to be a part of being at that table in a multipolar way to try to rectify, if you could allow me to use those words. So, so I think we have to be intellectually honest enough to understand that Russia has a view. And whether we agree with it or not, they have a view of history. And they have a view of where they want to be. Uh, and they're going to act and have acted, most recently, uh, to affect gaining that position. And, and again, uh, uh, I think, and it's just my opinion, they probably are not terribly unhappy with the progress they have probably seen. Well, it sounds to me um, that it's a difficult situation where the end goals that you've described from the Russian view, from the US, or the transatlantic view, uh, seem to be diametrically opposed, right? So where do we find those points of common ground and cooperation that you were saying? Uh, I do want to uh, open this up to the audience. I know you're eager to hear what everybody has to say. Uh, so if you have a question, please uh, let, let me know. 
Um, so I'll take a couple to start. Uh, Fred Kemp, President of the Atlantic Council, please. <laughs> I apologize to the audience that you showed favoritism, but uh, General Breedlove, I wonder if you could talk about, um, you've mentioned the elections, if you could talk a little bit about, from a military man's standpoint, what response would you be suggesting, accepting uh, what seems to be a high degree of confidence that Russian government is behind uh, the cyber attacks connected with the election? Some have written about what steps should be taken in terms of proportional response. Uh, what would be your advice? And have we taken uh, sufficient response yet? So let me take a couple of more questions. Um, uh, the lady in the middle there, yes. Just please wait for the mic and introduce yourself. Uh, and I just ask you to ask a question rather than making a statement. Thank yeah, you. this is a question. Uh, hi, my name is Mindy Reiser. I'm working with a number of NGOs that focus on peace building and conflict resolution. We're talking a lot about Russia and the US, but I, I would like the general to talk about the role of China in this. Russia and China have had their differences and their tensions and their alliances. How does that dynamic play against the role of the competition and the possible cooperation between Russia and the US? The role of China, which too is a major player and considers itself pivotal for world peace and uh, world instability too. Thank you. And one, one more question. Uh, the lady in the yellow jacket. Thank you, Rachel Oswald, reporter with Congressional Quarterly. Um, General, I wanted to go back to what you said about intellectual honesty um, as I posed this question related to U.S. plans for missile defense in Europe. The old plan, the, the old, it was previously stated that this was um, to protect Europe from an Iranian nuclear missile, um, as that um, potentiality seems increasingly unlikely, and as um, tensions with Russia continue to escalate, um, there are some murmurings that these sites should be reconfigured to make them um, uh, um, applicable to a Russian missile strike. However, the current plans wouldn't be able to protect from an intermediate range missile, I mean from an intercontinental ballistic missile, only an intermediate range missile. So we have plans in place that we're saying are to protect against Iran from a vanishing Iranian threat. We have a Russian threat. Are we, are we not acknowledging that it's to protect Russia for diplomatic reasons? Or is this basically a solve to our European NATO partners? And if it's a solve, could there be a better way to reassure them than these missile defense sites that haven't yet proven their capability? Thank you. So I'll let the general respond to those three questions about uh, the level and degree of response, perhaps military response, the role of China, and the last questions about uh, IBM and our defense systems. So Fred, thanks for a tough question. Um, uh, uh, I think from the, um, from the remarks I made, it's pretty straightforward that, that, uh, that I don't believe that a null set is the answer. Uh, I believe that, uh, that we cannot um, reward bad behavior with a no answer. So how our nation responds, I think, is important. I also believe, um, uh, and this is nothing secret, it's discussed quite openly, we rely so much more on cyber than some of our competitors in the world that if we were to start a big fight in cyber, we stand to lose so much more. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think that necessarily that's the answer. Again, what I think is that uh, our nation has a broad uh, series of, of tools, uh, diplomatic, informational, military, economic, that's a real rude, uh, uh, crude um, uh, approximation. But there's, there's a lot of tools to use, uh, and I think that we have to do that creatively, judiciously, but uh, probably the most important thing I said, which is, uh, which is probably the most controversial, is I don't think a null answer is the answer. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Mindy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, you, you bring up an incredible uh, complicating factor. Uh, it's going to be complicated enough, but incredibly important to find a way forward, I think, with Russia. And every time I say that, I want to say the following so that it doesn't get disconnected in reporting. 
getting, finding a, a way forward with Russia starts first with good behavior, measurable, verifiable good behavior. We cannot reinforce or, or legitimize bad behavior by skipping past it. Um, but finding a way forward with Russia, I think, is very key. And we have to start somewhere. The China piece is, is confusing because, as you know, that is a part of what uh, the tool set that Russia uses as it has its conversation with us. And, and what we believe about their relationship I think is broad in, in the work, in the writings. Uh, some believe it, some don't believe it. But the bottom line is um, uh, I think that Russia worries about all its borders and, um, and it has uh, issues on a lot of its borders. We have to be honest about that as well. Um, but we need to solve first a bilateral thing and not allow that to be played off against this third party to, to sort of slow down the deal. We need to be focused on trying to, to work our issue. Um, I actually believe there are a lot of opportunities with China too. I mean, I see what our industry is doing in some places. Uh, one of my particular university that I'm a part of and, and doing some work in now has got a deep a relationship with uh, industry in China and I think there's opportunities there as well and we should try to focus on the opportunities as opposed to the opposition. The last so the last one is, uh, is really hard. Um, so first of all, was it racial? Yep. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, F-16 ears. Um, so let me first disagree with one of your premises. I do not see the threat from Iran diminishing. Uh, I do not believe we have uh, a, a, a verifiable way to understand that their, their missile development is diminishing at all. In fact, what I see is continued testing and capabilities in a nation that is much more likely to use it than some others, a la some of the actions you've seen uh, uh, in the waters off of their shores. Um, so, so I don't think about this the way you do. I think that the missile threat, the missile threat from Iran is growing. And uh, ergo, uh, European phase adaptive approach remains a concern and remains a capability that we should pursue. Um, I'm an engineer. I know how a tippy to radar works and how it's aimed and how it's optimized. I know how, I know a little less about the Aegis system, but I do understand it as I was a part of developing the architectures. And I can tell you with, uh, with uh, my uh, reputation on the line, the Tipi 2 radar is optimized for shots out of Iran. Our uh, mm -hmm. capabilities in that site in northern Turkey and our capabilities uh, for the physical locations of the Aegis ashore capabilities give us capability against mm -hmm. Iran. I would never say that that doesn't give us some capability in other directions because I think that would also be dishonest. But this system was built aiming at Iran and I still see a threat from Iranian missiles mm -hmm. and I think that's basically where I'll leave that. So I do want to take another round of questions. I will mention that uh, we're letting this go a little late because we start a little late, which means the last panel will start at 1.15, just uh, a little point of organization. But let me take another round of questions, please. I want to go all the way to the back first. I see a hand on the aisle, the gentleman, yes, in the gray. <coughs> please wait for the mic. Uh, thank you for uh, your speech. And I just want, I have one question. Uh, you, you mentioned yourself, about- please? Uh, I'm Afghan Nifti with the Caspian Policy Center. Uh, my question about your uh, call for result producing cooperation with Russia. Uh, I think uh, Russia and US have been uh, working with the Minsk group to resolve the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict so far. And that was one area uh, which was different than Ukraine and Ossetia that uh, Russian and uh, US positions were kind of overlapping each other in order to uh, support the resolution. Would you suggest that, that 
that uh, at, at least this will be one point that uh, Russia and the U.S. can increase their efforts at least for the next administration uh, to try to resolve the conflict. About Minsk specifically? I mean, just uh, one point that maybe Russia and uh, U.S. can work together uh, in an increased manner. Okay. Uh, next question, please. Uh, the gentleman here in the glasses. We're waiting patiently. On the right. <laughs> Thank you. Manuel Neuber of the University of Graz. Uh, as you were talking about bait behavior, uh, you didn't mention Turkey uh, at all. It, it was just the last sentence on Iran. But I, I don't know if Erdogan just uh, forgot that, he's, that Turkey is part of NATO, as far as I know. Uh, but uh, yeah, what about this? Uh, according to ISIS, according to Russia, according everything to the European Union, to NATO partners within the European Union. This is so Turkey. I maybe you have some thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you. So one more question, please. Uh, let me go to the front here and take the gentleman in the middle in the beige suit, I suppose. Yes. Uh, hello. My name is Richard Field. I'm with the Budapest Beacon. Uh, General, um, in addition to being a military alliance, many uh, suggest that NATO is also a community of values. Uh, do you agree with this assessment? And if so, uh, does democratic backsliding in Eastern and Central Europe pose a threat to NATO, uh, in particular to its credibility as a deterrent force? And if so, what can and should be done to return those countries to the democratic fold? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, General Minsk as a point of cooperation, Turkey, and then uh, backsliding Eastern Europe as a threat to NATO. Small questions. Yeah, the questions are getting easier. Um, <laughs> so I think on the first piece, could Mints be a place where we uh, cooperate? Uh, I think the answer is every one of our uh, conflicts is a potential place for cooperation. It's a matter of do we, uh, are we willing to invest what needs to be invested to do that? Are we willing? to find regimes to move forward. The Minsk piece <coughs> is complicated a little bit because four of our very senior partners in Europe have sort of taken lead, uh, or four of our nations here in Europe have taken lead on sort of moving that process. And I think that our government has sort of allowed that to be the, the centerpiece of how we, we approach uh, Minsk and, and Ukraine, but certainly if, uh, the, if the two sides were serious, any of these conflicts, I think, is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be a very tough one. And we would have to first find our way forward with our European partners who are very involved now in resolving that conflict and, and work out how that might all, all go together. But I would not write any of them off of the list. So on Turkey, um, what I would like to say first about uh, uh, Turkey is that, that uh, across the history of the U.S. military, there have been many times in our nation where, um, where, our, where our government and the government of another nation was not connecting at a diplomatic level but all the time that they were not connecting at a diplomatic level, they were connecting at a military level. Some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, instances in South America are most demonstrative. And so um, what I saw as the SACUR, the military commander of NATO, is that our relationship inside of NATO and our bilateral U.S. relationship with Turkey certainly got put under some pressure by what has happened across the past year or so in Turkey. But what I would say is those relationships are still strong and capable and resilient. Now, they're, the face of the Turkish military has completely changed, as you know. And so a lot of individual relationships and things uh, are being rebuilt. But what I don't see is a schism in the mill-to-mill -mill 
business. Like every nation in the alliance, we don't always get along 100% with each other. But we manage to move past the places where we might have differences in a military sense to maintain appropriate, professional, collaborative, and, and uh, most of the time very cooperative uh, um, relations. And so um, I will only speak to the military side. That's what I'm unique, uniquely qualified to do, and I will avoid the landmine of speaking to the political side. Um, uh, I think that Turkey, uh, many forget that Turkey lives in a really tough neighborhood right now. To their north, the Black Sea, which is covered by uh, weapons from Crimea almost completely in a surface-to-surface -surface and coastal defense cruise missile capability, and about 40 or some, so percent covered in an air defense capability. So they have a body of water to their north that is very much being influenced by their neighbor to the north and east. To their east and to their south, wrapped in uh, a cloak of, of uh, some pretty tough fighting and, and societal issues. And so uh, from a military sense, this is a, this is a nation that is, that's living in a tough neighborhood, and I think we have to remember that. I'm not apologetic. I just want to make sure that, that, that we remember uh, from the position they find themselves in. And uh, the last one, uh, thank you for that question. Um, yes, we often talk about NATO and that we are a community of values and that is a great part of our strength, a great part of our strength. Um, and uh, um, yes, we have all along uh, NATO's history had times where Sometimes the nations went a different way uh, based on democratic processes, etc. Sometimes less, less totally democratic processes, but the nations have, have uh, maybe not perfectly aligned with all of the nations of the West in their values. And what I find and what I saw uh, multiple times sitting in the NAC uh, once at the Wales Summit, where our, our senior most leaders were at the table, is that there's a lot of work among the nations to try to recenter those who have demonstrated some concerning things. And this is the way that, this is one of the beauties of NATO, is that sort of internal self-policing and that internal um, cajoling and work that is done there in a way that is not publicly threatening uh, and causes nations to, you know, get their backs up. And so um, there are, there's work to be done. But I, I have a, a lot of confidence that the nations, it won't happen immediately, but I can tell you they'll work on it, and I'm sure they're working on it now. I've been out of the business for about four months, but I guarantee you they're working on it right now. <coughs> Well, General, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to, to sit down and have this conversation with us. There's no easy answers, uh, but it's really a pleasure to see an optimist uh, in the room. Uh, so please join me in thanking the General for his time. Um, and I would only ask everyone to please stick around. We have our last panel, which really